That was when I saw the pendulum. <laughs> oh my. That was no! <laughs> That was when I saw the pendulum. The sphere hanging from a long wire sat in the ceiling of the choir, swayed back and forth with isochronal majesty. I knew but anyone could have sensed it in the magic of that serene breathing that the period was governed by the square root of the length of the wire and by pi. <laughs> <laughs> That was when I saw the pendulum, the sphere hanging from a long wire, set into the ceiling of the choir, swayed back and forth with isochronal majesty. I knew what anyone could have sensed it in the magic of that serene breathing, that the period was governed by the square root of the length of the wire and by pi. That number which, however rational, to some <laughs> That was when I saw the pendulum, the sphere hanging from a long wire set into the ceiling of the choir swayed back and forth with isochronal majesty. I knew but anyone could have sensed it in the magic of that serene breathing that the period was governed by the square root of the length of the wire and by pi. That number which, however rational to subliminal minds, to a higher rationality blinds the circumference and diameter of all possible circles the time it took the sphere to swing from one end to end was determined by an arcane conspiracy between the most timeless of measures, the singularity of the point of suspension, the duality of the plane's dimensions, the triadic beginning of pi, the secret quadratic nature of the root, and the unnumbered perfection of the circle itself. It is also I also knew that a magnetic device centered in the floor beneath issued its command to a cylinder hidden in the heart of the sphere, thus assuring continual motion. This device, far from interfering with the law of the pendulum, in fact permitted its manifestation for a vacuum, any object hanging from a weightless and unstretchable wire free of air resistance and friction would oscillate for eternity. The copper wire gave off pale, shifting glints as it was struck by the last rays of the sun that came through the great stained glass windows. For its tip to graze as it had in the past, a layer of damp sand spread on the floor of the choir. Each swing would make a light furrow, and the furrows, changing direction imperceptibly, would widen to form a breach, a groove with radial symmetry, like the outline of a mandala or pentaculum, a star, a mystic rose. No, more of a tale recorded on an expanse of desert, in tracks left by countless caravans of nomads, a story of slow, millennial migrations, like those of the people of Atlantis when they left the continent of Mu and roamed stubbornly, compactly, from Tasmania to Greenland. 
from Capricorn to Cancer, from Prince Edward Island to the Svalbards, the tip retraced, let <laughs> take. when I saw the pendulum, the sphere hanging from a long wire set into the ceiling of the choir, swayed back and forth with isochronal majesty. I knew, but anyone could have sensed it in the magic of the serene breathing, that the period was governed by the square roots of the length of the wire and by pi. That number, which, however irrational to sublunar minds, to a higher rationality, binds the circumference and diameter of all possible circles. The time it took the sphere to swing from end to end was determined by an arcane conspiracy between the most timeless of measures. The singularity of the point of suspension, the duality of the plane's dimensions, the triadic beginning of pi, the secret quadratic nature of the root, and the unnumbered perfection of the circle itself. I also knew that a magnetic device centered in the floor beneath issued its command to a cylinder hidden the heart of the sphere, thus assuring continual motion. This device, far from interfering with the law of the pendulum, in fact permitted its manifestation, for in a vacuum any object hanging from a weightless and unstretchable wire, free of air resistance and friction, would oscillate for eternity. The copper sphere gave off pale, shifting glints as it was struck by the last rays of the sun that came through the great stained glass windows, where it's tipped to graze as it had in the past, a layer of damp sand spread on the floor of the choir. Each swing would make a light furrow, and the furrows changing direction imperceptibly that would widen to form a bridge a groove with radial symmetry, like the outline of a mandala or pentaculum, a star of mystic rose. No, more a tale recorded on an expanse of desert, in tracks left by countless caravans of nomads, a story of slow millennial migrations, like those of the people of Atlantis when they left the continent of Mu and roamed stubbornly from Patli, from Tasmania to Greenland, from Capricorn to Cancer, from Prince Edward Island to the Svalbards. The tip retraced, narrated anew in incompressed time what they had done between one ice age and another, and perhaps were doing still. The, those couriers of the masters, perhaps the tip grazed Agatha, the center of the world, as it journeyed from Samoa to Novaya Zemlia. And I sensed that with the single parton united Avalon beyond the north wind to the southern desert where lies the enigma of Ayers Walk. At that moment of four in the afternoon of June the 23rd, the pendulum was slowing at one end of its swing then falling back lazily toward the center, regaining speed along the way, splashing confidently the hidden parallelogram of forces that were its destiny. I have remained there despite the passage of the hours, to stare at the bird's head, that spear's tip, that obverse helmet, as it traced its diagonals into the void, grazing and the opposing points of its astigmatic circumference and would have fallen victim to an illusion 
that the pendulum's plane of oscillation had gone full circle and returned to its starting point in 32 hours. Describing an ellipse that rotated around its center at a speed proportional to the sign of its latitude. What would its rotation have been had it hung instead from the dome of Solomon's temple? Perhaps the kings had tried it there too. Perhaps the solution, the final meaning, would have been no different. Perhaps the Abbey Church of St. Martin de Champs was the true temple. In any case, the experiment would work perfectly only at the pole, the one place where the pendulum on the Earth's extended axis would complete its cycle in 24 hours. But this deviation from the law, which the law took into account, this violation of the rule did not make the marvel any less marvelous. I knew the Earth was rotating, and I with it, and Saint Martin de Champs, and all Paris with me, and that together we were rotating beneath the pendulum, whose own plane never changed direction, because up there, along with the infinite extrapolation of its wire beyond the choir ceiling, up towards the most distant galaxies, lay the only fixed point in the universe, eternally unmoving. So it was so much the earth to which I addressed my gaze, but the heavens were the mystery of absolute mobility was celebrated. The pendulum told me that as everything moved, earth, solar system, nebulae, and black holes, all the children of the great cosmic expansion, one single point stood still, a pivot, bolt, or hook around which the universe can move. And I was now taking part in that supreme experience. I too moved with the all, but I could see the one, the rock, the guarantee, the luminous mist that is not body, that has no shape, weight, quantity, or quality, that does not see or hear, that cannot be sensed,